The Shah Savan are Turkish-speaking pastoral nomads living in northwestern Iran. They migrate between winter pastures located in the Moran Steppe, close to the Caspian Sea, and summer pastures on Mount Sabalon, 150 kilometers to the south. The population of the Shah Savan is estimated to be 120,000 people. Of these, only 32 tribes, about 40,000, migrate every spring and autumn. Each tribe is divided into units of about 20 to 30 families who migrate and live near each other. Winter camps are located in the Moran steppe along the Soviet border. The nomads spend late fall and winter in this grassy steppe. In early May, rising heat slowly turns green pastures into a dry and dusty wasteland. The nomads migrate south to escape the heat. Traveling about 150 kilometers, they pass through valleys and hills until reaching the Meshkin plain buying supplies like rice, tea, and sugar in market towns like Mishkin, they continue their journey to spring quarters. Here, at the base of Mount Sabalon, they remain for the next four to five weeks. The snow recedes on the mountain by the end of June, and new pastures become available. The nomads then move to summer camps at altitudes of six to 13,000 feet. The Shah Savan spend three months in these highlands until freezing September temperatures force them to begin the return migration to the Moran Steppe. The breeding and sale of sheep is a main source of income in the nomadic community. Additional income is made through the sale of surplus milk and dairy produce. A Shah Savan household of about seven or eight people can live comfortably off the produce of a hundred sheep. Men in poorer families who do not own a flock large enough to fulfill their economic needs work as shepherds. In return for their labor, they receive sheep and rice to grazing land. In poor families, women have the additional burden of preparing food for the family to have hired their husbands. The strenuous task of churning milk to butter, cheese, and yogurt is also women's work. Sexual segregation among the Shah Savan is strictly enforced. Women are not permitted to have contact with men outside their kin group. Until the birth of their first son, younger women must cover the lower part of their face. Most women continue this tradition until menopause. Marriages are prearranged by fathers. Shah Savan girls are usually married by the age of 17, often to men eight to 10 years their senior. If a girl is not married by 18, the proverbial saying is that she has turned into sour milk. Marriages strengthen and renew ties between different sections of the community, as well as creating alliances between unrelated groups. Ben de bu görevden önce bu kadar
The two most common household units among the Shastavan are the paternal, where one or more married sons live with their father, and the fraternal, where two or more married brothers form a household. In households where fathers and married sons live together, the family is eventually forced to separate when cousins reach the age of six. Under Shiite Islamic law, first cousins can marry. So, they're not allowed to live in such close physical proximity. Among the Shah Savan, there is a strong patriarchal lineage system. It is expected of the man to obey his father, his father's older brothers, as well as his own older brothers. Often, the eldest brother in the household is the herding unit leader. When guests visit the camp, men honor them by cooking lamb in their presence. Other dishes are cooked by women and brought over. It is during these occasions that the leaders of various nomadic sections discuss the approaching migration. In early May, the Shah Savan begin migrating to their summer quarters. The leaders of each section are responsible for the difficult logistics of moving 40,000 nomads and thousands of sheep. By the time they depart from Moran, the nomads have sold all their surplus sheep and animals especially those considered too weak to survive the journey. The daily migration of the Shah Savan starts soon after midnight and continues through midday until exhaustion from the heat forces them to stop. Eight to 15 kilometers are traversed daily. At this pace, it takes about three weeks to cover the 150 kilometers between the winter and summer quarters. Each day, a familiar pattern is followed. The shepherds start moving the flock well before the departure of the nomads with their caravan of camels and pack animals. By late morning, the caravans catch up with the flock. Two men move ahead of the group to scout the region and find a campsite to rent for the evening. Villagers charge an exorbitant price for temporary use of their land. Frequently, the nomads are forced to travel through a hot and endless day before they can find a place they can afford. Prior to land reform in 1962, the nomads traveled along routes where they had the customary rite of passage for 24 hours. Since then, villagers have planted crops right up to the dirt roads, making it extremely difficult to find resting places. The constant harassment of the nomads by the villagers as well as the increased cost of renting pastures, has forced the Shah Savan to quicken their pace. After a location is chosen, there is a flurry of activity, unloading the animals and setting up camp for the night. Here, men and women's activities merge in an effort to settle as rapidly as possible.
In less than 30 minutes, the wooden skeletons of the Chassavan tents, which have provided shelter from the elements for many generations, fill the campsite. Rich and poor families coexist in the same camp unit, but they can be distinguished by the size of their tents, as well as the color and amount of felt coverings they own. Tents of the more wealthy families are new and lighter in color since the felt coverings are regularly replaced. Until the end of June, the Chassavan stay in their spring quarters at the base of Mount Sabalon, waiting for the snow to melt before completing their journey to the summer camp. Women dress in their finest clothing during the migration. Even the camels are fully adorned. For the nomads, the three months spent in the summer quarters are the most enjoyable period of the year. Disputes over land rights are rare because the summer camps are located high above agricultural fields. Daily activity centers around the camp unit. Women are busy preparing meals and fetching water, as well as washing and separating sheep wool used for felt making. A major event in Sabalon is the making of felt, an essential fabric for tent coverings, blankets, and floor mats. Professional felt makers from the city journey to the camps for this event. The nomads use their finest wool taken from the summer shearing for felt making.
After the wool is combed, boiling water is sprinkled over it. The wool is rolled around a wooden pole, and the ritual begins. Food must be prepared for everyone in the campsite. Meanwhile, the felt is unfolded, more boiling water is sprinkled over it, and the strenuous process is repeated for several hours. According to the Shah Savan, there are only two living craftsmen with the skill to shape the wooden rods for the tent frame. Replacing a tent, including the frame, costs approximately $1,000. Twenty-six pieces of felt are required to completely cover a tent. For these reasons, most families can afford to replace only parts of the tent at a time. Merchants often travel to the Shah Savan summer camp. Because of the strict rules of seclusion, women are not permitted to participate in these buying adventures, which remain exclusively a male activity. In Sabalon, bread is baked daily and women work together weaving carpets and caring for children. Among the Shah Savan, grazing rights are exercised collectively, and the larger joint family is an economic necessity. Men make decisions about herding, marketing of the flock, and animal husbandry. Even if personal rivalries exist in the family, partition of the household is postponed for as long as possible. In Sabalon, considerable time is spent visiting kinsmen feasting, and celebrating weddings. Most importantly, the nomads enjoy the relative lack of governmental control and infringement on their pastures and lifestyle experienced in Mogon. The nomads travel for two or three full days to attend a wedding. There, people from various camps gather together. Mm -hmm. 
For the women, this is indeed a break from their daily isolation. It is also an occasion to look for eligible young girls for future marriages. The segregation of women and men is strictly maintained, even during unifying ceremonies like weddings. September, the cold weather in Sabalon forces the Shah Savan to begin their return migration to the winter quarters. Favorable weather allows longer hours of traveling each day, and the return migration lasts two weeks. Since the 1960s, the nomads have experienced a period of irreversible change. Over 2,000 households have had their winter pasture lands in Moran confiscated. Thousands have been forced to add farming to their pastoral economy. Many have become sedentary farmers, selling off their flock and abandoning their nomadic tradition. The nomads face an economic dilemma. The price of their products, especially sheep wool and dairy produce, 
have risen very slowly, while the price of purchased commodities has increased sharply. Camel caravans, the age-old pattern of migration, are being replaced by truck and car migration. The paradox of modernization is very real among the Shah Savan, who try hard to foster and protect their rich heritage and tradition. On the one hand, they hold the settled life in contempt. On the other, there are multiple pressures to settle them, not the least of which are efforts of governments to control them. One-sided though it may be, the conflict rages to this day. As an old poem goes, O Shah Savan, come. Seize your endless migration, settle, take a rest. No longer drink that filthy water, says the Shah Savan. What need have I of houses and walls? Talk to me of wealth, the fat of sheep and goats. Come winter or summer, look, see the tulip gardens I have. 